the presentation by the alumna of the year, Rebecca Volgab. Well, welcome to this presentation. Um, very happy again for the award that I got yesterday and for all the support I got from WASP um, since I started, basically. Now I thought I could tell you a bit about my journey with WASP, the research I did, and also a bit my plans as for the next steps. And um, right now I'm an assistant professor at Chalmers, and my whole WASP journey started in 2016 as one of the first uh, PhD students in batch one. And I think at that point, I didn't even realize what was would become. So I just did my master thesis, was approached and asked if I want to do an industrial PhD. And then they told me a bit about the WASP program and I thought, okay, can be nice with some study trips and some courses. But I didn't know that was would have such a big impact on my life and on the lives of so many others and um, how big it would become that we would have this big conference hall here today filled with people. So it's really interesting to reflect on the perspectives that we had eight years ago and then how it has changed. So I did that uh, industrial PhD together with a company in uh, Gothenburg and there I realized that I like research more than industry work. And then I thought it could be nice to do a postdoc and uh, saw these was postdoc opportunities that were pretty new at that time and applied and then um, defended right when the pandemic hit. But still, I could celebrate a bit just like yesterday with a nice dinner. And then I moved to the US, just like uh, my previous speaker, he, who also did a, was doing a postdoc at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I was there as well for two years. A little bit challenging with a pandemic, but also really interesting to see how researchers there think about the world in different ways than we in Europe, and to work with these excellent people who are located there at CMU. When those two years approached their end, I discussed a bit with my husband, who is Swedish, and we thought it could be good to come back to Sweden. So I applied for an assistant professor position and then got it at Chalmers. Uh, so now I'm back at the software engineering division where I used to do my PhD. And I'm also supported by a WASP uh, professorship with a nice starting package. And I really enjoy it there. In, um, yeah, at Chalmers and um, also got citizenship last year. So that was another reason to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> so we can also conclude that if it hadn't been for WASP, uh, Sweden would have one citizen less and uh, <laughs> maybe my life would have turned out differently. So very happy for that. Um, that celebration, by the way, was in Slotskogen in uh, Gothenburg, and they didn't have a nice dinner, but at least a cinnamon bun and a cup of coffee, so <laughs> good enough. Yeah, so, and then, yeah, as I said, it's, like, interesting how my CV became a WASP CV, and um, when I think about all the advice I got from WASP faculty and from the community, from the alumni, my friends from the first batch who started with me in 2016 and now we're still friends and meet at this winter conference. It just feels really good to be part of such a supportive community and um, uh, has been a lot of fun. So very happy. Research-wise, I'm working on uh, human on the loop autonomous systems. And that relates a bit to what the WARA people were talking about, um, because if we think back to 20, 30 years ago, the whole point of automation was basically to get rid of humans. So we wanted to automate tasks that are boring for people to do or where systems are just more reliable when doing them. And um, nowadays, it seems like there's more and more an awareness that it's important to keep humans on board and help them understand what's going on in these kinds of systems. And now I think Jonas will be very happy about this picture because it's an ABB cobot, but I didn't know that at, uh, when I designed these slides that we would have another presentation here right before. 
But um, I did my um, bachelor thesis in 2013 at AVB Corporate Research in the same Westeros building as the one you showed. So there I got a bit of inspiration. And we have uh, these cobots where humans work together with robots on different tasks. And there are actually different ways in which we as humans interact with robots or other autonomous systems and how we are affected by them. So, for example, in some cases, we are the ones collaborating with robots on different tasks. Sometimes we are the ones that compensate for things that robots can't do. Sometimes we give input to the systems and say, okay, now do this or do that. Uh, sometimes humans intervene and maintain systems and maybe replace mechanical components or fix issues in the code. And sometimes we're just affected as bystanders because we share the same physical space as uh, robots or other cyber-physical systems. And that means we need to be aware of these different roles that possibly multiple humans play when such systems are being used in practice. And it also means that we need to address a series of challenges when working with that. And one of the biggest ones is the issue of trust both from the system side, but also from the human side, that we don't know if we can really rely on the system and we wanted to maybe make decisions that are pretty crucial for our lives. So it's important that humans can trust these systems, which is complicated because we have a lot of uncertainty for these realistic autonomous systems. It's impossible for humans to, or machines also, it's impossible to anticipate all kinds of situations in which a system can find itself in advance. So we have this intrinsic uncertainty that has to be dealt with so that systems make smart decisions at runtime and can yeah, be reliable and trustworthy. And then we have, of course, humans and machines who speak different languages and they need to express what the other one should be doing in a way that is understandable. And we have a pretty complex problem space where there are many qualities of interest, things like safety, security, performance, cost, reliability. And it's not only that all of these things have to be kept in mind, but it's often so that we have conflicting qualities. So if you want great performance, you have to pay for it and have a higher cost for cloud resources, for example. Or security and performance is another typical trade-off that you have to make. So there, maybe in some situations, the trade-offs you make are not the same as in other situations, and that complicates this problem space even more. And then, of course, there are other issues connected to that, but those were the top four that came to mind for me. So in my vision for the future, from my research agenda, I focus on human on the loop autonomous systems. Some people talk about human in the loop, which somehow sounds as if you always keep the human in the loop and wait for feedback at all points in time. Whereas human on the loop looks more like you have a human with oversight over the system and who can intervene if something goes wrong. And Sometimes I think about robots in my research, but in software engineering, we often want to develop techniques and architectures that are generally applicable, and then we have a few domains where we try it out. So in this presentation, I use a robot as an example, but it could also be a smart cloud system or something else. And there, in this vision image, we have the robot on one side, the human on the other side, and both think about the other player. And they wonder, what does the human do? And the human wonders, what does the robot do? And then to enable good collaboration, that image of what you assume the other one is doing has to be accurate. And there have to be mechanisms for the human to express what they want the robot to do and for the robot to express what it wants the human to do. So we have to have this interaction between these two players. And what makes it more complicated is that sometimes we don't only have one human, but multiple humans who all have their own ideas. 
for example, safety experts might th see things differently from end users or business owners. So we often have to find mechanisms to support them finding a consensus and working with each other and specifying what should be done by the system. So there, so far, I've been doing things in certain of these areas. For example, preference elicitation, I developed some approaches that make it possible for humans to say what their needs are, what their preferences and interests are, and then to express that in a way that a system can understand by specifying properties and a utility function that it can use for optimization, which is a requirements engineering problem where humans express their requirements and then give that to the system. And on the other side, I also worked on monitoring and developed an adaptive monitoring approach together with some collaborators. There, the idea is that for big, complex systems, it's stupid to monitor all things all the time, but you want to do it in a cost-effective way that saves bandwidth. So only monitor the things you really need to know so that you can verify certain safety properties and other things. And um, there, maybe in some situations when you just start the system and maybe drones start flying, you need different properties than when you are in a mission and you maybe want to monitor the GPS locations more thoroughly or something like that. And then I worked on trade-off explainability, which is connected to what I told you before about these conflicting qualities um, and finding ways to, for humans to understand, ah, this is what the problem space looks like. These are the key decisions. These are the qualities where we have to make a decision of what is more important. And then that can inform this uh, preference elicitation as a next step. And negotiation and finding ways for different stakeholders to collaborate is also one thing that I've been working on. So in the future, I want to do some of the things that are not here yet. And I also don't plan to work alone on all of these things because now I'm building up my research group and I've already worked with many collaborators but that I'm very grateful for. So here are some of them on this slide. Uh, I have two WASP PhD students where I'm the main supervisor and two where I'm the co-supervisor. And now I'm hiring more people and also recruiting postdocs. So if you're finishing your PhD and think that this sounds interesting, we can talk about it. And um, so for the next step, just as a bit of an idea for you, what I plan to do is on one hand to find ways to make this more adjustable to different contexts at runtime, because maybe the explanations you want to show differ depending on who is working with the system, what kind of availability they have in their mind and the awareness of this being a problem. Yeah, maybe sometimes you just want a quick and easy explanation, sometimes you want more details, so we need ways to adjust this at runtime. For the preference elicitation, it's also like that. You maybe don't want people to explain or to specify in detail what is needed, but make that lightweight so that we can get quick feedback when a system is running and we need good architectures and approaches for that. Then in this context, recently we got a nice uh, WASP Nest grant together with some of the, yeah, I see some of my collaborators here. That's connected to cybersecurity because these things are not only relevant for autonomous systems, um, um, yes, they are relevant for autonomous systems, not only for robots, but also in a cybersecurity context. So there we want to develop a software supply chain that is or to make the software supply chain more secure by creating a nice security analysis platform. And that should also keep the human on the loop and make it possible to see in a dashboard what is going on, what trade-offs have to be made, and what kinds of decisions are good to take. So I'm really looking forward to this nest that is starting in April, and maybe we will be back at the next winter conference and tell you more about our progress in that area. And then for the left side, where I haven't been doing so much yet, I want to develop ways for a robot to have a runtime model of the human 
but not so that we capture all complex things that are happening inside a human, because we as humans are pretty complex beings with, like you could model a, per a person's childhood and everything that influences how you think and make weird decisions. That is not feasible in practice, of course. So we want to focus on exactly the key factors that are important to model and then help a robot to understand, okay, right now is a good moment to approach a human and initiate collaborative tasks. And recently, I also started working with a new PhD student who was hired with an um, was project grant on conflicting requirements because that happens a lot as well, that you have multiple people with conflicting requirements. For example, if I'm at this conference center and want to go to the train station and I have four minutes to catch a train, but the system, an autonomous car, tells me that that is only possible if I exceed the speed limit a little bit, then may maybe many of you would say, okay, exceed it a little bit. But uh, it's not obvious that a system would do that. And you have to deal with this conflicting requirement in that case of meeting the deadline and meeting the speed limit uh, constraint. So we need ways to make decisions in those contexts where we have conflicting properties so that humans can be involved as much as needed, but as little as possible so that systems can make smart decisions and don't have to bother the human too much. And as I said, I'm hiring people. Um, one of my P open PhD calls closed yesterday, but there are still further opportunities in the future. So I'm happy if you approach me and um, I'm here the rest of the day so we can take further discussions there. Thank you very much. Thank you.